Kia ora koutou. Welcome everyone to today's panel about digital activism. Uh, my name is Cathy Errington and I'm the Executive Director of the Helen Clark Foundation. Uh, if you haven't heard of us, we are a public policy think tank based at AUT in Tamaki Makoto. Uh, please do uh, check out our work. Uh, our core business isn't actually uh, campaigning. Uh, our core business is publishing um, public policy research. Uh, but however, we have slightly ventured uh, into the space of campaigning with the recent cannabis referendum um, because we released a piece of research called The Case for Yes in 2020 where we decided it would be disingenuous to pretend that we didn't have an opinion about what we thought our research showed about the state of New Zealand's cannabis laws. Um, but the people on the panel today have a lot more experience than me in uh, how to campaign and how to change public opinion. Um, so it seems a really timely moment to have this discussion because, of course, the nature of campaigning uh, has moved online uh, in a manner we could never have imagined um, when we were all at NetHui uh, in person last year, um, both here in New Zealand and, of course, in the United States with their upcoming presidential election. Um, both of our, our campaigns have been uh, enormously changed by the fact that it's much, much harder to do events in person. And so we've done a lot more online. Um, in the United States, example, they've had presidential debates with our audiences. Uh, they've had online conventions. Uh, and particularly, at least on the Democratic campaign, they've had far fewer large in-person events uh, than would have been expected. Uh, here in New Zealand, of course, we we, we had some of the same uh, problems. Uh, I know uh, we had many in-person events planned, uh, and which we had to cancel all of, and we moved to, to doing webinars. Um, and those have been, in some cases, enormous. We had more than 10,000 people on one of our cannabis webinars. But my, my concern was always that maybe we were just grouping the people that already agreed with us um, together. And it was hard. No one just wandered into a webinar the way people, uh, particularly students, used to just wander into our in-person events. So, so that was something that caused me some uh, anxiety. But like I said, it was essentially my first campaign. And it's not something I do every day, which is why it's great to be here with this amazing lineup of panelists to us, what does this all mean? Uh, how can we make sure that online campaigning is, is a force for good, uh, that it isn't a vector for hate speech and conspiracy theories, and that we can use the tools online to try and make the changes we want to see in the world? Um, to avoid just having my voice uh, ramble at you for any longer, I will hand over to our panellists to each introduce themselves and give a brief introduction to the organisation they're from and the sort of campaigns they do. Um, we'll obviously get more into this in the discussion, so please um, you know, keep it short. Uh, but uh, if starting off with Laura, if, if you could just introduce yourself, that would be lovely. Cool. Um, yeah, kia ora. Thanks for that introduction, Cathy. My name is Laura O'Connell Rapira. I am the director of Action Station. Um, Action Station is a community of 300,000 New Zealanders who use the internet to um, take powerful and coordinated action to bring about a just, uh, fair, flourishing and tiriti honouring Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, we do that in a myriad of ways, which I'll talk about a little bit um, throughout this conversation. Um, but I'm also on the board of an organisation called The Workshop, um, which is a think tank that um, researches the way that we speak about important kaupapa um, or issues or topics um, and how, they, how, they, how the way that we can communicate um, can effectively shift hearts and minds to more progressive and inclusive positions. So I'll be bringing both of those whakaro or perspectives into this conversation today. Thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan, um, would, could you give us a quick intro, please? Sure. Kia ora, Kathy. Kia ora, everyone. I'm Jonathan Mosen. At the moment, for the last year and a half, I've been Chief Executive of WorkBridge, which is an employment agency that connects disabled people with employers. But I think mostly what I'll talk about today is really in my capacity as somebody who's born blind and also has a hearing impairment. I have been involved in government relations. I worked professionally in the government relations field for some time. I'm an IT professional, having designed a lot of the products that I'm using to get my own job done and have a lifelong passion for trying to make the world a better place. So much of what I'll talk about really has come from a, a grassroots perspective rather than anything organisational. Uh, Tamitha? Yeah, uh, kia ora koutou. Huri uh, aho nō ngā te awa me wā kato tainu hoki. Uh, ko Tamitha Paul tōku ingoa. 
Um, kia ora everyone, my name's Tamitha. Uh, I hail from Ngāti Awa, which is an iwi uh, along in the Eastern Bay of Plenty, and from Waikato Tainui, which is a Central North Island iwi. And uh, yeah, so my, my current job is uh, on Wellington City Council, where I'm responsible for the Central City, for climate change, for young people, and for city safety. So a pretty broad range of uh, responsibilities. Uh, but uh, the, the way that I got here was through, uh, yeah, I guess, grassroots organising at university uh, for a number of different causes. So hopefully get into talking about some of those later on. So yeah, kia ora. Awesome. Thanks very much. I was going to hand over to Emily to introduce herself, but uh, I can't actually see her there. Are you there, Emily? Uh, okay, we've lost her temporarily, but that's all right. When she comes back, uh, we'll get her to introduce herself. Um, so in the in the meantime, uh, I thought I'll kick things off. Um, I'm, we're very happy to take oh, Emily's return. Um, <laughs> would, you, would you be able to uh, just quickly introduce yourself and your organisation, Emily? I would, and I'll be very happy to as long as my um, work Wi-Fi holds out. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Emily Rakiti. I'm the press spokesperson for People Against Prisons Aotearoa. Uh, we're an anti-capitalist and prison abolitionist organisation um, with branches in Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch and Dunedin. Um, our approach is based on two social changes based on um, classical ideas of class struggle and of, of, of conflict. And I'm not afraid to acknowledge that there, there are contradictions and conflicts in society that um, have to be played out through confrontation, through struggle. Um, and I see social media and new technologies that um, allow us to communicate as a key part of how we coordinate those struggles. So I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. Awesome. Well, welcome. And um, thank you all so much for, for bringing your expertise to the conversation today. Um, we're all the panelists are very happy to take audience questions. So I'll ask a few scripted ones just to warm things up. Um, but please do put those questions in Slack and uh, Jess will be moving them over for me uh, to to ask uh, the panel. Um, but firstly, I thought I would uh, ask a question of Laura um, from Action Station. Um, I owe Laura credit for the language I used to describe today's panel, um, uh, to describe what we're talking about, uh, that quote, how can we protect what is best about the internet that is allowing marginalised people to organise? Uh, how do we protect that while regulating against the worst of the internet? So hate speech, misinformation. Um, so uh, thanks to Laura for that language. And I was wondering, what do you say to those who say that attempting to regulate social media platforms is futile given their size and their influence? I would say to those people that it's a really great point and, um, and it means that um, if we acknowledge that they have a lot of resource and um, they are too big, then what we need to do is we need to tax that resource um, and we need to break up the digital platforms who currently have a monopoly over our democracies and the information um, pathways that are used for so many things in life these days. Um, you know, you can order food to your front door, you can raise millions of dollars for a business or a charity. Um, we we get a lot of our news and our information um, online. We connect with our friends and our family, uh, both in our communities but across the world online. And so I think, um, yeah, protecting the best of the internet and protecting that ability for us to connect across time and space is essential. Um, and at the same time, um, we must do all that we can to prevent unfettered, unmitigated hate um, and lies from being able to also spread across time and space without any kind of transparency, accountability, um, or, um, or regulation. Uh, despite your concerns about the, the, the way marginalised peoples are treated on various social media platforms, uh, you continue to be active uh, across many platforms. What keeps you there? What, what's, what's keeping you active on social media? Um, a strong sense of... Um, understanding of whakapapa. So whakapapa is this is this concept, um, this belief system. It's sort of the the way that um, Maori think about the world. It is the long and never ending line that goes from the atua or the gods to the earth to our ancestors to us to our descendants. And um, whakapapa is really central to my uh, my political beliefs um, in that um, we ha are always 
tupuna in waiting, ancestors in waiting, and we're also descendants. And so it is our job to um, build a better world for the people who are yet to come, whilst also acknowledging all of the incredible work that the people who came before us have done. And so, um, and so for me, the reason that I involve myself in political organizing and dedicate almost all of my waking hours to working out how we can make the country and world a better place um, is because of a strong sense of playing my role in protecting whakapapa. Um, the reason I'm still on online platforms is threefold. One is reach, two is impact, three is strategy. We live in a digital age, 90% plus of, um, I think it's 90% plus uh, of the people in New Zealand have a Facebook account. And so it just doesn't make sense not to be where the people are. Um, you know, over the past six years, Action Station has um, grown from a community of 200 people to now 300,000 plus people. And we have grown that community using the power of the internet. We, I've been involved in campaigns where we've crowdfunded um, money for legal cases, we've crowdfunded money for billboards, we've crowdfunded money for research, we've delivered petitions signed by tens of thousands of New Zealanders, and some of those petitions have led to legislative change or changes in the way that government funding is allocated. Um, we've been part, been part of a project where we brought together 10,000 New Zealanders using online surveys and discussion forums to develop a vision for the future of our country in 2040. And so I guess um, thinking from a whakapapa perspective, um, it would be foolish not to use the tools that are available to us in this time to um, that I'm sure that my ancestors would have loved to have access to. I think Tam once describes um, the internet as sort of like an ocean, as a connecting force. Um, and... And I love that imagery. I love the poetry of that. And I also um, think that's absolutely true. The internet is what connects us, just like the oceans connect us. And um, to not sort of navigate the internet and learn how to paddle our way across it um, would, be a, would be a waste and a shame. Uh, did any of the other panellists have comments on, on that issue? No, no, we're all right. Okay. Uh, well, moving on then uh, for, for Jonathan, um, you've been active for many years to make sure as many people as possible have access to public life in general, uh, but including online and offline tools. Uh, could you tell us a bit uh, about your campaign to improve the census? Sure. Just by way of background on all of this, I think it is important to understand that advocacy for disabled people is doubly difficult because first we often have to get past what I call the tyranny of low expectations. A whole bunch of how do you questions that often see disabled people underestimated because there's so little public education about what disabled people are capable of if only we had a truly enabling society. And only when we get past that can we actually start making the argument that we are deserving of a society that doesn't exclude us. So for those not familiar with what happened to me with the, the last census, I was going through my inaccessible snail mail one day, and these days I use blindness specific equipment, um, an OCR app actually on my iPhone to do that, and it speaks the printed text to me. And I found the letter from Statistics New Zealand. It contained my census code, and I needed to type that in to complete the online census. But the only trouble was, I couldn't get a clear scan of the number. And obviously with a code like that, you've got to have it perfect. So I was mindful because I am pretty well connected in the blind community that in other countries, including Australia, blind people can get their census codes texted to them. In fact, we can vote with the aid of text messaging here in New Zealand in the forthcoming and the last few elections. So I called the census hotline thinking that this would be very easily resolved. And I was told, sure, the text will be coming right up and then I was contacted by another official who told me that they couldn't text me my code for security reasons. And of course, I felt a TUI billboard coming on at that point. Um, I was told the same thing about security initially when I started advocating for talking ATMs, which were widely available in other countries, but somehow they weren't secure enough for blind people in New Zealand. So because of these so-called security risks, I actually had an official, a senior official, turn up on my doorstep from Statistics New Zealand on a Sunday afternoon just to dictate my census code to me, read it to me so I could write it down. The irony is, once I actually had the code, I found completing the census 
an exemplary experience from an accessibility perspective. They did a great job with the online form. So I wrote to the minister about this. And as a blind person, uh, having access to politicians by email and being able to read their replies is really empowering. It helps us participate in the public discourse. The only thing is I got a reply from said minister's office in a PDF file that was a scanned image and therefore inaccessible. So I posted to my blog, I posted links uh, to those articles on social media. I started using a hashtag called blind people count to try and drum up support for a more accessible sentence. And that's a difficult one because um, for accessibility reasons and socioeconomic reasons, there are fewer disabled people online really than members of any other minority, even though disabled people are the largest single minority. Uh, I'm a political junkie, so I follow many local journalists on Twitter and I contacted several by direct message to explain the situation to them. Now, some simply don't care about disability issues. If you mention disability, quite a lot will switch off thinking that disability issues belong with the social issues reporter or the health reporter. But in the end, this is a political issue about discrimination from a government department. Uh, and so the officials and the responsible minister should be held to account. So all it takes though, is for a couple of journalists to get the point and that gives the story legs. So I was really fortunate that that happened and the story was run in mainstream media. I also want to applaud the team who runs parliaments, who run parliaments online presence, um, right from their consistent use of uh, texting uh, on social media. In other words, describing captions on Twitter, giving captions to uh, to uh, images, through to the actual website itself. Parliament genuinely is brilliant at accessibility. It's right in their DNA. So the online parliamentary system had just started their petition online process. So I was able to set up a parliamentary petition in a far more accessible way than I would have been able to previously. In the past, it would have involved a lot of paper and I would have had to have assistance to do it. So I was able to petition online, get other people to sign. In the end, my online activism made it easier for me to make my point. I did get to make an oral submission to a select committee and I got a promise that they will do better next time. So this is a way that online accessible uh, advocacy really can help disabled people to feel part of the social discourse. And I, I think you almost answered my, my follow-up question there, but I thought I'd give you a chance if you had anything you wanted to add. Uh, what were the tools that were most effective in that campaign? Uh, was it online or offline tools or a mixture of both? Uh, well, I think the key tools for me as a blind person, obviously, is the fact that I'm fortunate enough to have access to screen reading software and, and tools like that. And I know that there's been talk elsewhere at NetHui about the digital divide and digital inclusion. So it's really critical that we realize that actually these days, access to the internet is a human right, particularly for disabled people. Uh, for some people, reading the newspaper on their tablet or something is a, a nice thing to do and it's a convenience. For me, it makes the difference to either being able to read the newspaper or not read it at all. So those tools of accessibility, in my view, should be fully government funded and they should be available to every disabled person so they can be truly digitally included. Thank you very much for that. Uh, my next question uh, is for Emily, uh, who is still with me, thankfully. Um, <laughs> when, uh, so I, I found one of the challenges, <coughs> and I, I mean, we haven't so much been campaigning, but we've sort of attempted to do it uh, in the cannabis referendum, uh, is that you're dealing with a group of people that you're trying to build sympathy and understanding for who have historically been stigmatized and been tr treated as inherently bad or, or evil. And so in, in, in our case, that was dealing with drug users um, as a group uh, and kind of, kind of coming up against that problem that some people just don't really seem to care very much if uh, bad things happen to, to drug users. Uh, and I, I was interested with your work uh, with Prison, uh, people Against Prisons Aotearoa, um, how do you try and build empathy uh, for a different group of stigmatised people, that is, people who are or have been incarcerated? Yeah, thank you. I think it's a really important question. Um, I, I think it really comes down to a, a, like a basic 
element of our worldview that um, it's easy to dictate to people, but is is quite hard in, in practice to, to really build this practical understanding. And the this is not a new idea. I often talk like a quite old fashioned kind of um, like old Soviet man who just works in a factory hitting a girder with a hammer, maybe. But um, the the basic reality that a lot of us don't understand is that we are part of a class. Um, that's a very old fashioned concept now to a lot of people but the, there is a there is a basic economic reality which is that some of us control production and some of us don't and um as a as a criminologist i'm in my criminology office right now <laughs> um but and, and as an abolitionist when we look at who is in prison um the answer is that it's maori people and that it's people who are from the working class um data that we got under the oia in incidentally a scanned inaccessible pdf format despite us asking them not to. Um, data that we got from the Department of Corrections under the OAA showed that um, people in prison, 89% uh, of them weren't paying income tax in the three months before they were incarcerated. In other words, um, people in prison are almost solely the unemployed. So there's a very clear class character in how prisons function, which is that they cram people from um, the working class and Māori people into these warehouses where we don't really do anything to help them. We don't do anything to fix the economic conditions that drive people into prison. And then when they come out, um, their life chances have been drastically reduced because it's completely legal to discriminate against previously incarcerated people. So we have this clearly economic category to which the majority of us here belong, um, which is very sharply divided when we look at people who are in prison. And so the task that we have kind of been grappling with as an organization is how do we help people understand that um, just because they are not in prison does not mean that they have nothing in common whatsoever with prisoners. Um, and one of the most important kind of tools that we've used, that we've put together so that people can, can use it themselves, is uh, the Prisoner Correspondence Network. So PCN, um, again, starts off as a, a little bit of an old-fashioned idea, but uh, it's a it's a pen pal network. Not a new not a new thing at all by any means. But um, what it does is it allows people who um, may have never had any contact with an incarcerated person in their life um, to get into contact with someone who is inside by writing letters. I mean, and it started off as a purely um, analog medium. It, it let you literally put pen to paper and write a letter to someone inside. And, and we use an, a mailing list to, to get people in touch, but um, at, at, the, at the base, it was an analog system. But um, we rapidly found that people were really interested in talking. People inside were really interested in talking to people outside. But people on the outside were also really interested in talking to people inside because what they were finding was that they had a lot in common. They had interests in common. Um, I mean, interests in the sense that um, you're interested in art, I'm interested in art, we have things in common, but also class interests in common. You grew up in an ex-industrial town which was absolutely devastated by four decades of neoliberal economic policy. Well, so did I. So we were building connections that demonstrated not just on an interpersonal level, but on a structural social level, um, that people who are in prison and people who are not in prison are a, a unified force that we should we work together to free each other. But it started to become unsustainable because it was so popular, because people were interested in getting in touch. The first it ballooned on the inside because um, everyone told all of their mates that this pen pal system existed. Um, and then it ballooned on the outside as more and more people found out about a PCN, um, which incidentally you can find at PCN.nz if you're interested in. So our um, tech working group who are all incredible and understand computers in a way that I will not even pretend to, um, worked on um, basically digitizing the pen pal system. So we've got a piece of custom software that was made by our tech working group that allows, um, it's like a, a hub that lets you um, get in touch with people inside, get in touch with your pen pals and um, email to their e-prisoner email address, which um, a prison guard on the inside will then print off and hand over to that prisoner so that they can read their mail. Um, this massively, massively streamlined just the physical labor of scanning all of the physical letters that were coming out of the prison, but it also caused a major uptick in how many people were engaging um, with the network, which has really, really helped us to build that class solidarity inside and outside of prisons. So we've just had an audience question come in for you, um, Emily, that I thought I would ask you because it, it really is picking up on what you were just saying. Um, they're asking about the idea that as activists, 
uh, we perpetuating the systems we're trying to resist by using social media platforms. So it's that idea that you know, when we're using the platforms, they're essentially a kind of means of production, which is ultimately enriching um, someone else. Uh, so what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, we are all, each of us, I know all of every, everyone here, we're all totally addicted to posting, right? I'm not going to pretend that I'm not. Um, I would shrivel up and wither away if I didn't get likes. Um, but feeling like all of our individual psychopathologies aside... <laughs> Um, yeah, absolutely, we are. We're all making um, Jack from Twitter and Zuckerberg richer um, by by using those. Um, but Laura, I think, touched on this before, right, which is that we need to, to break these monopolies up, um, which is, I think, a, a, a broader question, right? How do you seize the means of production? Has anyone done that before? I, I maybe, maybe someone's done that before. Maybe we should have a look at what, what has been done in the past in order to take control of these things. There's, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is not God. Um, he looks like data from Star Trek, but he's certainly not divine. Um, these, all of these platforms, um, they are physical possessions that are held and controlled by one class. They can be held and controlled by another class, um, but that, that's a question of, of political struggle. Um, that's that's something that the outcome of which can only be decided by by organised people um, exercising political power. Uh, but uh, moving on to Tamitha, um, I was interested uh, because you're one of the most active counsellors on social media anywhere in the country. Uh, what do you find useful about social media platforms as a way to reach voters? Yeah, so I suppose the first thing is um, it's the, probably the reason why I'm one of the most active counsellors in the country is because most of the counsellors are super old. Um, but also, um, I, I suppose just with the question, it's 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 actually reaching people who don't vote. Uh, I would say it would be my my big audiences that I reach um, via social media. And if I were to weigh up like what the kind of political payoff was in terms of people that actually voted for me based on what I posted on social media, it's probably pretty low. But that's besides the point because we don't use these tools to connect with people who vote because we know who votes and those are. Uh, they're important people, and obviously, like we we pledge to to represent them as well. But I'm more interested in talking to the people who don't vote. I'm more interested in talking to people who don't have time to engage with council or can't come to our submissions that are at 9:30 a.m. Uh, till till 12:30 p.m. because they are either sleeping from their night shift the night before, or they are at work, or they're running kids to school, doing all the things that I guess normal people do. Um, I'm more interested in in engaging with the yeah the people that that don't participate or, or aren't actively engaged with us. So I suppose that that's the that's the first point. And I feel like I kind of have to use local government because it is very dry. And it's that's reflected in, in that turnout as well, um, is that it's quite dry, but it is still really important. And I suppose that's some of the really big issues that we have in front of us today, whether it's our, our issues with, you know, the three waters or whether it's with, um, you know, heritage trumping um, building housing or, or our transport issues, any of those kinds of kind of issues that are before us, um, quite often they slip through the agenda kind of unnoticed. And um, so I see social media as a way to bring attention to the things that really need it and, um yeah, so, and, and I suppose the other thing too is that quite often because of the engagement with local government, a lot of the local media is quite conservative. So they're not really interested in someone like myself banging on about the needs of young people, the needs of Māori, the needs of mana whenua, the needs of people with disabilities, the needs of students, you know, all of these different demographics that um, some of them, you know, don't tend to vote. So I suppose it's trying to... Um, to the most that I can balance that narrative or to be able to explain the things that are reported on, which unfortunately are always um, those bits, I suppose, that appeal more to your more conservative um, engages. But, yeah, I suppose there's the practical element and there's, like, the information sharing element and it's been really cool uh, seeing more, especially young Māori who have been utilising social media in order to share information. So, like, I'm thinking about people like Takuru Jews and um, people like Safari Hines who have used their uh, their platforms to get more people to sign petitions, who've collaborated with organisations like Action Station, um, who have 
who have really been bringing that information to normal people and particularly to young people and particularly to Māori and Pacifica people. Um, and But I guess the other side of that is that um, it means that a lot of misinformation can be out there too. And so I guess going back to what Laura started talking about is, yeah, I guess I see the internet as being, you know, growing up in the generation that has had it at our fingertips the whole time. It's something that really urgently needs to be decolonised or there needs to be some kind of tikanga set around it in the same way that when people, you know, when, when our tipuna traverse the Pacific and, and and would travel between those islands to connect with other people and to share information and to do all the things that we can now do with the internet, there was re- very strict tikanga around that um, that navigation. And so I think, again, there needs to be really, that we, we need to have that conversation of what is the tikanga that we set around there to protect young people, because I guess on the other, ha- other side of that conversation are the really negative outcomes for young people around, uh, around social media and the use of um, the internet, which I think we're all pretty aware of. So, yeah, so I guess it's about sharing information, trying to make local government a little bit more engaging. I suppose something that I hear a lot is it's quite cool for other young people, young Māori, young wahine Māori, to see someone like them doing something like politics. You know, growing up for me and probably for everyone on this panel, there weren't really any cool politicians as you've got now, like people like Chloe and um, Marama and Debbie Packer, like all those people, you don't, you, you didn't really see that growing up. So it's quite cool to be able to see that more personalised and more accessible role to the people who are decision makers. So uh, just coming back to Emily, um, I was interested. Could you tell everyone a bit about Arms Down New Zealand and how you you worked on that? Yeah, so um, I'm going to put my criminology kind of hat back on because I just taught a class um, about this. So uh, I'll try not to I'll try not to give too much background. Um, basically, in October of last year, the police commissioner did it and did a surprise stand up press conference and announced that um, squad cars full of armed cops carrying uh, assault rifles, guns, and maybe trained attack dogs um, will be put on patrol effective immediately, uh, primarily in brown communities. Um, dog shit idea uh, is my professional criminological opinion Uh, because we know what happens when we give cops guns Uh, two thirds people who are shot and killed by the police are brown Um, putting armed cops on patrol in brown communities um, that can will will that would only have ended in more brown people being shot and killed by the police Um, this is not new criminological wisdom (laughs) Uh, we've known this for decades Um, so immediately alarm bells started ringing for everyone in the country, basically, because everyone could see that this was a really, really bad idea that was going to end with people being killed. Um, so the Arms Down campaign was kind of the people against prisons of that was our That was what we put together in order to start coordinating a mass response to this effort by the police to rapidly expand the kinds of deadly force that they had access to. Um, what, so what did it mean in practice? What, what did the Arms Down campaign actually mean in practice? Well, I, I think to explain it, I kind of have to explain a bit about the theory of social change here, right? Which is difficult because we don't all share a theory of social change. Like I've been talking a little bit about Karl Marx so far. I'm probably going to continue to talk about Karl Marx. Um, not an arbitrary decision on my part, but it's I can't explain the entirety of Capital uh, during a, a video chat, unfortunately. It's a good book. You should read it. But what I can do is, is, is say a little bit about how... I see social change being brought about, and I can point to some relevant examples. Um, America, in case you were under a rock, which would be really, really, I would like to be under a rock a little bit at the moment. Um, But America has been on fire for months now. Um, Martin Luther King said that a riot is the language of the unheard. So it's not me saying that riots are good. It's the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. saying that riots are good. Um, But America has been on fire, and rightly so, because the American government has been butchering black people in the streets and executing them like animals for generations now. I um, mean, it's a problem that hasn't gone away. It's a kind of murder that the American police force is now responsible for carrying out. And we see it happen sometimes live. Um, I watched someone being murdered by the American cops on live stream on the bus the other day. Um, that's the, the world that we live in. <laughs> um, and that doesn't go away from posts. I've yet to see someone post uh, white supremacist terrorist violence out of existing. Um, 
I think that posting is important. I'm here to talk in part about posting and how to post really well. But for a theory of social change, I don't think that posting is going to cut it. Um, what cuts it is organized masses moving with a unified political purpose with a clear understanding of where the contradictions are in society and how to take advantage of those contradictions. And I think that the Black Lives Matter movement is working at those contradictions, at one of the key contradictions in the American state, which is that the American government relies on terrorist violence at home and abroad in order to secure the rule of its capitalist class. But in order to do that, it needs to kill people in the street and people don't like being killed in the street. So the Arms Down campaign was our effort to bridge the gap between those of us here and those of us here, I'm not pointing fingers, those of us here, right here, sitting in this specific chair, um, who are logged on and post a lot. And I, I am logged, I am, I'm logged on, don't worry about it, I'm logged on. Um, but Arms Down was our effort to connect um, those of us who are logged on. Seems like Emily has cut out for me. Um, uh, so, uh, unfortunately, we've we've lost you there, Emily. But um, it, I noticed that I before while we wait for Emily to return, um, we I missed an audience question earlier that came in, and I think it's timely uh, because of the, you were seeing the government signed uh, New Zealand up to a statement on encryption. Um, and so the, the first audience question we had come in was, how important is secure and encrypted communication to enabling activist work online? Um, would it, uh, who would like to take that one? Can you, can you wave so I know? Um, one, someone wave. <laughs> all right, or I'll have to just go right, Laura. I can say one thing about it. Um, I would say that um, I don't use it very much in my New Zealand-based activism, but I do use it for um, communicating with activists that I'm connected to internationally who live in places where, it, where it's much more dangerous than New Zealand to um, be communicating across um, uh, and through channels that aren't as, as, as safe. Um, that might be somewhat naive um, uh, because actually, um, you know, who's to say that, like, our democracy in New Zealand, because we do not have a written constitution, we are actually relatively fragile in that regard, and it, it would be relatively easy for an oligarch, like a, a maniacal, like for someone like Trump to take over, given our current constitutional um, arrangements within this country. And I think the only thing stopping that from happening is New Zealand's leanings towards um, progressive-ish politics um and the and but that's by no means secure or guaranteed and so um and so yeah we, i don't use it for my new zealand based communications with activists i do use it communicating internationally um i was lucky enough to see um, one of the trade union organizers involved in the hong kong protests speak at a conference recently and i know that um encrypted communications was really key to their success um because um because it was absolutely necessary over there Anyone else have comments? I am. Um, I got my Wi-Fi going again, which is yeah, pretty cool. Um, we okay. use encrypted. Um, we use encrypted messaging for our organisation um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, we're endorsed doing crimes, but um, there are direct action tactics like, um, for instance, chaining yourself to a desk, which is a crime, and I don't think any of us are uh, horrified or sickened at the thought of chaining oneself to a desk. So, um, let's go with that example. Um, you can absolutely have your communications intercepted. And if you're planning something like chaining yourself to a desk, um, then they can get the leg up on you and prevent that from happening. Um, using encrypted communications to coordinate stuff is really, really important. Um, we actually, following an action, had a number of our members arrested and then wiretapped for about six months so that the police could gather um, what little intel you can get from people having phone sex i um, not sure that much of the phone sex was um, relevant to the organisation, but um, all that stuff ended up on someone's desk and um, the police headquarters in Wellington. So um, it's definitely something that does happen in this country and there are times tactically when it's important to use. I also just think it's best practice to get used to using these kinds of measures whenever you can. Like I, I've mentioned that I'm not a computer person. This stuff doesn't come naturally to me. Um, but everyone here today probably is a computer person. Um, and that's just kind of part of the good habits that we can form um, in order to be responsible, 
critics and consciences. And the next question I wanted to direct is one that's coming from the audience. I wanted to direct it to Jonathan. Um, it's asking how can central and local governments support the use of, it says other platforms, but I think they mean social media platforms um, for communication. So what, what would you like to see government agencies doing to make their platforms more accessible? I think there are guidelines in place that are quite reasonable. Uh, there is a little bit of variation in the degree to which they're adhered to. So I would like to see some significant sanctions. I think it should be a KPI for every government department that their uh, online experiences are 100% accessible. There's another point I would make too, which has come up uh, in the context of, of, uh, of advocacy and the fact that some people have been lamenting the fact that online advocacy has changed the dynamic. Um, and that is that for some disabled people, actually there have been some real advantages to what has happened during the COVID era. So as someone who's totally blind all my life, I'm pretty used to finding my way around unfamiliar places, but I also have a hearing impairment and it's absolutely staggering and, and pretty upsetting actually, that I can find myself in an environment where all sorts of accommodations have been made. And I don't begrudge those accommodations for a second, they're the right thing. So we'll make sure that there's an, an appropriate porphyry and a karakia and various other things, but oh my God, a hearing loop? Absolutely no, no one's thought of a hearing loop. So I'm sitting there wanting to contribute in a public setting and I can't hear because of my hearing impairment what the speakers are saying. So for me, the added stress of not uh, having to get to a, of having to get to a venue and then wonder whether I can even participate because no one's cared enough to accommodate hearing impaired people versus being able to sit in an environment that I can control and participate via Zoom. I'll take the Zoom every time. Um, the one thing I would say is I think the private sector has a much bigger problem. I have been advocating for. Well, since the moment that the New Zealand Herald's premium um, subscription system became available, I'm really fortunate I accept that in that I am able to pay for the New Zealand Herald premium content. Their website has serious accessibility issues. I did my best to advocate in a constructive way to the editor of the Herald. I tracked down the person responsible for the digital uh, premium content and had a chat to them via Twitter. I eventually wrote a post on Geek Zone because I thought that's a pretty public forum. And eventually I got to the chief executive who made extremely sympathetic noises and nothing has changed. For me, it is absolutely outrageous that blind people or and people probably with some other accessibility needs are shut out of one of New Zealand's few major news distribution channels through issues that can be easily fixed. And I see a question coming up about what people can do to sort of amplify some of the work that we're doing. I guess what I would ask for is uh, a lot more sympathy and many more retweets. It really disappoints me that when I've been talking on Twitter, and I have 4,000 odd followers on Twitter, when I talk on Twitter about how wrong it is for disabled people to be shut out of something as fundamental as one of our leading newspapers in the public discourse, very few people actually care. And it just reminds me how far we have to go before disabled people are not second class citizens in New Zealand, particularly given that, you know, how many disabled journalists can you think of in New Zealand? How many disabled people do you see on the TV every night or on the radio when the political panelists are uh, put together on programs like The Nation or Q&A. How many of them are visibly disabled? We're, we're invisible. So I think the bigger problem is not so much government at the moment, which I do applaud for a lot of the work they've done. It's, it's the private sector. So we're coming up towards the end of the session. We've got about um, five minutes to go. So uh, given 
our limited time, I'd just be interested to see what the other panellists had to say uh, on that same question about what can people do to help you speaking. Uh, the, the way the, the question that's come in is what can the people watching today who are relatively privileged, uh, what can they do to support and ap amplify your activism? Uh, if we start off with Laura uh, and um, then I'll, I'll go around the others. Um, donate, <laughs> uh, to be honest, um, like, yeah, if you, if you're, if you have a like secure salary, um, people in the NGO sector, people in grassroots organizations don't, and we still have rent to pay, um, and food to buy and whānau to help and all that kind of stuff. So donations always good. Um, the other thing I would say, I'm making assumptions that maybe there are quite a few Pākehā in the audience, um, uh, is that um, I think that a really key part of um, decolonizing and re-indigenizing our country, which I know, which is something that obviously I, I'm really interested in and would like to see, um, is, is racism. And um, there are certain things that people will say in front of you that they won't say in front of me. And um, you need to be calling it out every single time. Um, but that is not enough. It's not enough to call out the interpersonal examples of racism that you're a privy to. You also need to be... Um, uh, taking action to um, to stop institutional racism from existing within our structures and our institutions, and that means voting for political parties that are, uh, have policies that are explicitly anti-racist. That means talking to your workplace about um, about your anti-racist policies, not just diversity and inclusion policies, but anti-racist policies. There is a difference, um, and um, yeah, and uh, spending spending your privilege essentially. Um, or spending your political capital if you have it to standing arm in arms with arms and arm in arm with uh, disabled people, tangata whenua, trans queer people, young people, migrants of colour, etc. Uh, Tamitha, we haven't heard from you for a while, so um, uh, what what do you think about that question? I pretty much agree with um, everything Laura said, and you know, really early on. Um, in my kind of in my very short um, political career, um, I got Laura to come in and, and talk to my team at the Student Association of Vic. And something that really stuck with me is um, when Laura said that everyone has something to contribute. And so I suppose it's about figuring out how you can be helpful. And just from my like short tenure of involvement in the NGO space, um, yeah, I think it's it's money. Like I think we need more money to be able to do the things that we need to do. Um, and I guess, like Jonathan said, you know, it's about that awareness and really amplifying the voice of people um, on on social media, I guess in news articles, having their back, um, being good allies and, and all that business. So, yeah, I suppose it's being figuring out where to be helpful and um, I guess figuring out where to stand back as well and allow for different groups to kind of speak for themselves but also, yeah, knowing how to be a good um, ally. So, yeah, I think that's, I'll leave it there. All right, so we, yeah, we've only got uh, about two to three minutes left. So, Emily, if you could keep it to a minute, um, what, what do you think people can do to help you? Yeah, I definitely can because I talk real fast, so I've got no worries. Um, yeah, definitely. So, like, to cut back before the Uni Wi-Fi censored me, um, the Armstrong campaign worked because we had a website that we could use to communicate to people and tell them, here is what to do. Lots of people care about stuff. Everyone here right now thinks that racism is bad. Guarantee it. Tell me different, I challenge, I dare you. Um, but what people who think racism is, is bad maybe don't know what to do is like, where do, what do I do with my feeling that racism is bad? Well, the website, the Arms Down campaign, all of it worked because we had a website that told people what to do. I don't know how to do that. I'm a criminologist. I can explain to you in really clear terms how the last 200 years of history in this country have led to an epidemic of racist police violence against Māori people. I could not tell you how to make a website, even remotely. I couldn't even begin to tell you how a website is formed. So you have skills. Everyone has, like, I have, I was making fun of myself, but I have skills. You have got skills. My office mate over there has got skills. We all know how to do stuff. We need to put those things together. And organisations, um, those provide a structure in which we can put those skills together. So I mentioned we have a tech working group. They're the ones who handle all the tech stuff. I know how to look at statistics and explain them. I know how to look at history. And so by combining that stuff, the Arms Down campaign ticked. If you care about something, find the organizations, find the community groups that are organizing around an issue and fighting back on it, and make sure that they know how you can work together. Because I guarantee um, with all of this, 
skills that all the people who are here have got, we could crush anything. Well, on um, that note, I'd just like to thank all of the panelists today. Uh, it was really great. To, to hear from you all and your incredibly um, diverse and rich uh, experience with campaigning. So thank you all so much. And uh, I hope that you guys got some inspiration from this session and some ideas um, of, of what you can do. And I'd just like to finish on the note, given that I started by mentioning we've been active in the cannabis campaign. Um, it isn't over. The referendum isn't over. If you haven't voted yet, please vote. Um, and please... Um, uh, if you know people that might not have voted, uh, reach out to them, talk to your family and friends, turn them out. Um, this, this thing isn't over until Saturday. So, um, yeah, please, please keep at it. Uh, that's the note I'd like to end on. And um, thank you all so much for joining us.